Namaste and in La Catch, and welcome to this episode of One World in a New World. I'm your host, Zen Benefiel, and this week's guest is Dr. Keith Brewer. He is the monk without the funk. So we're going to get into that a little bit and find out what that really means. Um, he's a leader in happiness and healthier employees and bottom line things in the business where you can work with mindfulness and qigong and various things that actually bring a healthier life to you. He's a public speaker, speaker and leadership coach. He's a graduate of uh, Pacific College in health and of health and science um, and also of the, uh, he's got a doc doctorate in acupuncture and Chinese medicine. This is a really fascinating subject as well. So he is a Taiji and Qigong instructor too. And I'm just looking forward. We've had a brief chat prior to, and I, you can tell I'm so excited to get on with it that he's welcome to the show. Thank you. And thank you so much for having me. And I hope everyone listening to the show gets something out of this. I think they will. We already have, and it didn't, we, the show hadn't even begun, right? So when I interview my guests, and, and we have a conversation about how they found their inner voice, inner guidance, the connection with everything, when it was in their life, what was going on, and, and the events and things like that, and how others perceived it at the time. So with you, when did it start? I know you've got a really rich childhood that I'm anxious to hear more about. Okay, it, for me, it started when I was about six years old. The people at the school I was going to called my parents one day and said, we really think you should take this kid in to have x-rays done of his neck and his back. We think there's something going on. So the short end of that is after talking to three orthopedic surgeons in a row, every one of them assured my mom and my dad and me that I was going to be paralyzed by the time I was 13 years old because of- What a multiple, thing to hear at that age. Right? I mean, I didn't even understand half the words they were using. Anomalies, that was a word I'd never heard before. I had to go home and look it up. Oh, yeah. Vocabulary and, building time. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, I liked to read. So we'll get <laughs> that in just a second too. I was a very avid reader. Um, but on the way back from the last doctor, I asked my mom if these people all knew what they were talking about. And she pulled over to the side of the road to give me her full attention turned and told me they had done their best to take me to the best doctors available to us. And it was gonna be up to me to prove them wrong. Now I found out later in life that my mom never ever expected me to prove them wrong. She went home and talked to my dad about how much it was gonna to cost to put a ramp up to the house, porch around the house so I could have access from the wheelchair. Yeah, when you've got those experts, right, that are telling you things are this way, then right. you know and uh, but as a child you believe in things still that adults kind of forget how to believe in right so at that age i actually firmly believed that my mom had just given me the power and told me i had the power to prove these people wrong. not just about the power but gave you permission right she gave me that permission and told me i have the power and i absolutely believed her now, fortunately, I already had what we know today's world as a sleep disorder. I didn't sleep at night. I slept during the daytime. I was always up at night. Um, basically, my parents loved that, didn't they? Oh, yeah. I used to wake my mom up at 3 o'clock in the morning. Mom, I'm still awake. She was like, oh, go sleep with the dog or something. But, right. You know, she was patient for a long time, but eventually it kind of... Oh, sure. Worked. As a parent, you got to be. Right. We were living on a farm. She was running the farm. My dad was always off to work. So she was running mm. the farm, taking care of my dad, taking care of four kids. One of them, my brother, we won't get into that. He was really sick. He died when I, you know, when he was 16, but sorry, no, that's okay. I mean, yeah. things happen. I learned things. Condolences from for you. Congrats for him. He doesn't have to deal with all this. <laughs> exactly. Um, he, he got freed of this life and I, I'm happy for him, but at the time I didn't sleep. We were living in a very strict Christian household. I, I've grown beyond that into more of a spiritual way of thinking. But at the time, my dad only allowed us to read the Bible in the house. We couldn't have any other books in the house. So by the time I was six, I was an avid reader. I'd read the Bible three times and I spent a lot of time thinking about well, what is an avid reader. Yeah, <laughs> I liked to read and that's all he would let me read. So I read it. 
but and uh, if you've ever read the Bible, you'll know some passages are a little bit difficult to figure out. Mm, quite. So I spent quite a few times reading something over and over and over and then thinking, okay, what does that mean? Then I'd gain what I thought was some understanding and I'd move on. And I always gained understandings that were from a loving, compassionate point of view. So when my parents would take me to church... And, Isn't that the way it's supposed to be? It is, but you go to church often and it's from an angry, vindictive perspective. Yeah, so, you know, we, we create our own karma. That's not God. Right? So <laughs> I would, even as a kid, I was questioning preachers in the middle of their sermon saying, um, I'm not really sure if that's... You did that too? Oh, oh man, yeah. I got so Absolutely. much trouble. Yeah, that might get us off track from where I was going with this, but I definitely... All right, I'll set up. Let's go. They finally asked my mom to leave me home. But anyways, at that time, she told me, you have the power. She gave me the permission to prove them wrong. So that night, when they all went to sleep, I snuck out of the house, went out into the woods. We lived on a farm, upstate New York, had plenty of pine trees on the woods. I went to my favorite clearing in the woods, and I had two concepts in my head that came out of the Bible, straight out of the Bible. I'm not making all, any of this stuff up. One of the concepts, which I wasn't even sure at the time if I totally understood, but I thought I was going to do my best to get this down, but because I know it, it's just important. Mm -hmm. One of those concepts was to be like an empty vessel. So I knew I just couldn't have a lot of stuff going on. I had to keep my mind as quiet as possible. And the other concept was that if you can learn to listen to the voice of the Spirit, it will speak to you. And my understanding at that time of that statement was that it may not speak to me in audible English. I have to keep my mind open to other forms of communication. So I went out to my clearing with these two thoughts in mind. I looked up into the sky and I projected the thought one time, if you're who they say that you are, you're going to help me. You know why I'm here. So then I kept myself quiet and I kept waiting. I kept waiting. I don't even know how long I waited. It didn't matter. Mm -hmm. At some point, I felt compelled to move in certain specific ways that I had never thought of moving before. Nobody I knew moved that way. But as a kid, going out there for that reason and believing in my heart that this spirit was out there, and if I could learn to listen to that voice of the spirit or interpret its message, it would speak to me. I never questioned that it was something out there was giving me the information to move in a certain way. So I never questioned it. I continued going out to the woods and that clearing every night for that. And as long as we lived on the farm, which was another three years, every night I would go out to those woods in that clearing and do those exercises. It wasn't until many years later that I found out that the two exercises I learned out there were two very legitimate ancient Qigong exercises from China that were designed for spinal strength and flexibility. This was absolutely what I needed. It's interesting how, as a child, right, we really don't have any barriers. We're very vulnerable. We're trusting. We're inquisitive, curious, and explorative. And so without any distractions, barriers in the way, it would seem that with those questions, as we are told, ask, seek, and knock, right? right. So we do that. We trust that, okay, we read the words. It must be true. Let's check it out, right? And then we found out it is. It is. I, I had a similar, um, you know, I was orphaned at, at birth, adopted at six weeks. At four and a half, they bring my adopted sister home and decide that, okay, it's time to tell me that I'm adopted. And there was no question of love or things in, in the family. I, it was just unconditional and, and wholesome, right? Um that was 32nd degree Mason. Mom was an English teacher in junior high. So really well-rounded people. I'm standing on the landing in the house that we had. We had a two-story um, when I was young. And I've got my elbows on the windowsill, my head in my hands. And I'm looking out of the front porch at night, waiting for dad to get back from the store with ice cream. And I'm like, five maybe not i mean four and a half it was a couple of months after they told me and i must have gotten into a quiet space because all of a sudden i heard hey you 
just as loud and deep as you can imagine, so much so that I spun around immediately and asked mom, who was sitting at the bottom of the stairs about 15 feet away, if she heard the voice too. I knew she must have. It was so loud. She didn't. She said, oh, I didn't hear anything. Must have been a peeping Tom. And I'm like, okay, I know what I heard. So at night, then <laughs> I developed this practice at night. I would stand in front of an open uh, a window with curtains open, lights on inside, reflection off the window, couldn't see outside. So there was the unknown. And I would project that same voice out, hoping for a return. And of course, as a kid, you do stuff like that. Your mind's racing all the time. Right. It wasn't until I shut up <laughs> internally, it returned. Oh, yes. Because how can you, okay, this is a, this gets into something I've always wondered. When people talk about prayer, they're talking about, oh, please give me a car, give me a new job. I'm like, you're constantly, talking, yeah, yeah. you're constantly talking. How can you hear anything? Right. I mean, well, say, you know, spirit prayers, wants, the talking spirit to wants God, to. meditation is listening. Right. And then they poo poo meditation because it, oh, it, it's, you know, that's a bad thing to do, or at least a lot used to. And, and my belief, if I'm going to God or going to the Spirit, it knows why I'm there. Right. So I don't need to say anything because as long as I'm talking, I'm never going to get a message. I just, you need to be quiet. You need to be calm. You need to be empty, like that empty vessel that I exactly. absolutely had the concept right. And if you are. Like we that, learned that as kids. You, you, you know, I never thought of the blessing or, or the, the however you want to term it the gift that we were given because we explored that we asked questions we were curious and we had the freedom to do so absolutely but i i always understood that okay you could look at my situation back then and say oh that was terrible you were going to be paralyzed no i was never going to be paralyzed what it was was an awesome opportunity for me to open up to something bigger than i am sure and it was an awesome opportunity for me to learn that something out there will communicate with you if you're just quiet and if you're just open to receiving that and if you're and i've always remained that way and i've always told people we have to remain as children mm -hmm. it says so in the bible now, like I told you in the beginning, I've opened up to a greater spiritual awareness than just being what I was raised as. But there's a lot of truth in that Bible if you look. Oh, there it. is. There is. I've read it multiple times as well. And, and after the awakening I had as a teenager, I thought, okay, there's got to be some things, you know, other places where this is so that I can have cross-references. So Absolutely. I read the Vedas, the Rig Vedas, Upanishad, Bhagavad Gita, Urantia book, you know, anything I could get my hands on Yes. that would explain what i experienced and what i experienced was uh, akin to what the vedantic philosophy calls unitive consciousness in which i was a divine thread of as a point of light that i saw myself uh, i saw others as points of light so i had to have been one right and that this is that connection we have that there is the one in the many each one of us has that we're all cosmic consciousness condensed into form becoming aware well how do we become aware you ask questions and you shut up exactly i mean that gets back into one of the things we were talking about we're all one we're all many we're all the many in the one we're all the one in the many and if you can't get your head around that just think about it for a while because the understanding will come to you if sure. You, if, and if now there's know. science behind it. Quantum Absolutely. physics. Is, you know, I, I had a discussion with Dr. Irvin Laszlo. Um, well, gosh, it's been almost a year ago now. And in that, I had a lot of questions I want to ask him because, you know, here's a, I had just turned 90, over 200 books, you know, um, twice nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize, study or writer of consciousness and the higher self. So mm. I wanted to try and, and, you know, it wasn't that I was trying to be impressive. I had genuine questions of mm -hmm. integrating certain things that I thought he might be able to answer. But what he even says is that, uh, you know, I was talking about quantum physics, that we're, you know, 99% space and 1% material. He said, I would disagree. We are 100% energy. I agree with that. 
and I, I couldn't disagree, right? It was like clung, the bell got rung. And when you hear truth, you know it in the depths of your being. It, there's no way you can argue. You can try, and many do. Okay, but yeah, but normally if you try and you're arguing intelligently and honestly, you're going to convince yourself that that was true. Well, you eventually, yeah, you whack, whack away your own truth until what stands is irrefutable. Absolutely. So how did you move into your teenage years and, and moving into life? And, and how is that path for you in finding initial direction in the world? Well, it was a little rocky at first. Once we moved off the farm, I'd been doing those meditations for three years every night. Mm -hmm. And we moved into suburbia and immediately moved into a neighborhood where all the other kids in the neighborhood didn't really think I belonged there. So I was physically challenged on the street to and from school and had to spend about eight years fighting my way to and from school daily. Mm. Now, I never wanted to fight. I'm not a fighter. I had poetic things. I'm a musician. I, I really don't want to fight. But um, It's not in our nature to fight. No, but I also didn't have a father that I could go to and say, well, these kids are trying to beat me up. I didn't have anybody I could run to, and I didn't want to hide. So I stood up to them, and I defended myself. I never started a fight, but I defended myself, and I got pretty good at it. So in and, this and respect. Exactly. And one of the things I do today is I teach people self-defense. So that's, that's another offshoot. But mm -hmm. I went through those years, and what I always try to do and always have tried to do is, okay, I was in a situation, the universe obviously wanted me to learn something from this. Not just how to physically defend myself. There has to be deeper lessons. Sure. So one of the things I've lessened, and I carry it into the work I'm doing today with business leaders and all of them, talking about how to be a conscious leader and how to be the leader that connects with people and gets them to come to work because they want to be there and not just because they have to is a concept of Taiji or Tai Chi, what we call today. And that's how I used to defend myself. I couldn't fight force with force. I'm a small guy. Hmm. If I tried fighting force with force, I would have gotten destroyed over and over and over again. And I did not. I would, I learned how to intercept their energies and redirect it. Tai Chi, Aikido. I have a dear friend that um, I've had over half my life that is a black belt Nikito, an instructor. He's also a um, lawyer. <laughs> he was actually the, uh, what they call him, the, the Karmapa. He's the Western attorney for the newer Karmapa, which is a lineage of Buddhism. But he, um, you know, it, it's all about the, uh, and he does mediation and negotiation, things like that too. And it's just a wonderful heart-centered human being. And in talking about the Aikido, you know, I, I feel like a lot of times in my life, because of the confrontations I've had to face, much like you, verbal as, as well as physical, more verbal because I talk a lot and people want to argue with me. So, I, <laughs> so it's like cosmic Aikido, right? You take the words, you don't let them lodge, right? and you figure out a way to return them gently. And it disarms people. Right? Yeah, I learned that eventually. And initially, these people weren't, I mean, I was hit in the back of the head with a baseball bat one day. Ooh. There wasn't any talking. Uh -uh. So this is not a talking situation. This is me saying, turning around and saying, wow, um, my turn. And I took the bat. And that guy was so freaked out, he just ran away. And I'm like, all right, I got a new bat. Cool. So well, it's funny how you know the aggressors, and, and this is part of, of even the I became executive director of a or co-executive director of a global peace movement called Live and Let Live. We had two principles: don't aggress, be an excellent human. Absolutely. And the don't aggress has to do what our long-term vision is: is to remove all aggression from the law. Absolutely. And that's a lot. That's that's going to take a lot of work. However. <laughs> if living in peace then we have to have rules and order in order to do so that we all agree on and that's going to take as much effort as any it's going to take some time oh yeah and yet look what's happened with the pandemic right how did we come out of that we were talking about this pre-show 
silver linings, right? Your business went from face-to-face -face Qigong instruction to suddenly having a world as your audience. Absolutely. And same thing, you know, I I told my wife at the beginning of it, I said, I really hope this gets people, the obsession on self-hygiene and sequestration gets people to turn inward and start examining themselves. And it absolutely did. It did. And then you see these, like you, you came online. There were many others who came online looking for others who were doing the same thing because right. they knew that this was all a facade and there was another way to move forward that we had to choose absolutely i mean I a good friend uh, the, let me finish that real quick I, I was reminded of a good friend swami beyond ananda is what he goes by his name is steve berman he's a new age comedian he says it's not about the great reset it's about the great we set that's awesome that's an awesome way to look at it and I, I think this is all about, like, in the Tai Chi world, it's all about being like water. Mm -hmm. All right? If you find friction, do you just sit there and hit the friction, or do you go around it? This is it us. It depends going... on where you're at and, and your what your mission is, right? If that friction is the only way toward something, then well, you, then you to wear it down. It. Yeah. But uh, a lot of my methods, what I teach business leaders and managers and supervisors is not to keep confronting friction, but find a compromise, go around it. Yeah. Step aside, talk to it. Talk to it. Exactly. And that's one of the things I eventually learned in the self-defense world after a few years was like how often you can just stand there and take a punch and then talk to somebody. Instead of just saying, oh no, that 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 Oh, yes, the immediate, right, like um, the cause and effect, action, reaction. The right. And um, we have a choice of how to respond rather than react. We do. And unfortunately, when I was first put in that situation, now I don't want to get too much into this, but my father was a very, if you know about the religious background, he was a very much into spare the rod and spoil the child. Mm. So there was a lot of physical abuse going on in the house. I never stood up to him. I stood there and took everything. I refused to give him any reaction. But then when I got out into the streets and they started attacking me, I'm like, no. Yeah, no. I'm not going to put up with this. No, I, I, I had a lot of pent up aggression that I had to get out before I could start really thinking about how else can we handle this? Sure. And that's a an interesting point because those things do build up. We withhold all of this release because we're we're... We keep it inside, right? We've got Absolutely. no way to release. We've got nobody to talk to. Well, we've got we, no way to. I don't mean to interrupt you, but. No, go ahead. I'm very, one of my famous soapboxes is there are some Qigong exercises that are specifically to release that stuff. Mm -hmm. I didn't know them at the time. I studied a lot of Qigong since then, but there's specific Qigong exercises because if we keep that stuff bottled up inside of us, it harms our physical health. It harms our emotional health, our spiritual health. There are ways of releasing it that don't involve just, you know. Right. Well, it's like raising children, too. I had a discussion with my mother. I was divorced. My kids were nine, seven, five, and two. And then they moved away. Didn't see them. One's in high school. The oldest one's in high school. And my mother and I were having a conversation. This is the English lit teacher, right? She said, wow, she ought to know better. And I said, well, mom where would she learn it right and that stopped her in her tracks because if we don't have the opportunity to learn something we don't know about it someone doesn't care enough to tell us about it or to call us on our shit, right that exactly. hurts sometimes but that's what a best friend does Absolutely. they let you know that yo <laughs> you know that's you might want to rethink that one yeah do do rethink that one yeah, that's why I consider myself very lucky because of what happened when I was six, I was able to tap into something out there. Mm -hmm. And because it was so successful for me, I was determined to maintain that connection. Right. So well, I let's would... talk about the out there for a second. You know, the, we're both kind of out there guys. <laughs> right. So in relation to that, we were talking earlier about the difference between the brain and the mind and the non-local mind and how 
we kind of forget that there is a much greater being that is in us and we limit ourselves by the way we think right we pay attention to the well, the cursory level stuff we don't dive deep we don't let go we don't find like you and i were able to do the silence right right where we could actually communicate and once that communication takes place and, and for you how did that how when you were in that quiet space or in what many call the nothingness from which all things come what's the experience of that how is that different than being just aware well for me and i'm sure it's very much the same for you and for others that have been there there's just an in, um, an intense calmness there, there's no questioning there's there's no questions it's all like everything's fine everything's perfect all i have to do is learn how to tune into this and everything's fine i don't have any questions i don't have to worry i just follow my path and if you're willing to tap into that i mean it's going to let you mm -hmm. and if you want to know your path it'll show you just like people ask me all the time is qigong a religion and i'm like no people practice it as a religion but it's not really a religion it's an, a philosophy of practices that allows you to get higher more in tune with your higher self mm -hmm. okay so for me when i get into the nothingness there literally is oh man it gets into that concept of it's everything and you you understand that you're part of everything and everything is a part of you except you're nothing Okay, and, and so it gets into that paradox that doesn't seem like a paradox at the time. It seems like, oh, that totally makes sense. And it does. And, and it, it does. That empathic resonance that we spoke of earlier that Matthias DeMott mentioned in, in his interview with Tucker Carlson some time ago, in that, you know, even with all the manipulation back to the pandemic, even with all the manipulation, marginalization that the media and the authorities and whatnot kind of pushed on us all and got a lot of people to buy into as a result there was still this seeking empathic resonance that matthias found was resident in pretty much everyone and how do so here's something that you know we all recognize is taking place we all are looking for it we have this inner desire the core of us in, in my opinion is to simply love and be loved well how do we ascend to that and still be able to bring others with us and not <laughs> not be labeled as something unkind okay now i'm i'll just be able to give you my take on that sure um first of well, all you can give me your my other you a take on it right <laughs> the, the in my catch right <laughs> yes uh, i could do that but i i won't i'll keep this in right, right. I this is your side of the fence <laughs> yes so and i actually am drawing from the scriptures on this answer too sure that's great um, if you try to force someone to listen to this it's not going to work pearls right. before swine all you can do is be an example of what that connection can do for someone what can that connection and let people know that it can do that for everyone all you have to do is learn how to be quiet and then hope that you know out of a hundred people will two of people listen maybe and is that good maybe all right because is everybody going to listen honestly no not really but more and more people like you said post COVID, are listening and more and more people really, I believe, and I think you believe, like we said, more and more people want to know the answers to these and want to know how they can tap into this. Because I don't feel special for this. I just feel lucky. Me neither. It's because it's so available. Exactly. Right? It's we just, and we're not that special because we had to go through a lot to become aware of it to begin with and, right. and those events are not pleasant you know i call them excruciatingly fun 
Absolutely. <laughs> I can't agree with you more. But at the same time, I think that we can be examples to other people of I what, hope so. what can be hooked up to, what can be accomplished. And they don't have to go through all of that. They can just think, oh, if you just learn to keep your mind empty, mm -hmm. learn to <laughs> When we get to the how. Right. How do we do this? You know, there's lots of different examples. Tai Chi being one of them. I've got a, a, you know, it's like a form of prayer. You put your fingertips together and just deepen your breath and feel your heart beat in your fingertips. Right. So you're, I mean, out of your mind. Like you said, there are a lot of different ways. A lot of different ways. I think is awesome because it'll resonate with everyone. Mm -hmm. Okay. Like, there's a lot of people like you, for instance. I think that got through here into some of the places through the yoga traditions that really didn't resonate one with one of me. the paths yes one of the paths i won't say the only of course yeah but well, I mean, I've kind of <laughs> trust me i i've been down as many paths as i could possibly find because right. I they and all I've, had to be I've tried a lot of them somewhere. i've tried a lot of them too but they just didn't resonate with me as much as the ancient chinese path did mm -hmm. that's just the one that touched me but i understand that there are a lot of paths. The whole the whole common thread, though, is deep breathing, calmness, keeping your mind empty, mm -hmm. because the spirit out there, you don't have to tell it what you need. It knows what you need. And if you if it knows you're receptive and you're just being empty and open, you're going to get answers. Is it something beyond us, or as Laszlo would agree with it's our higher self. Okay, that's that's the question, isn't it? Because I could answer yes and no. I mean, it is beyond us. I know because I get we're... references from both places too. Right. <laughs> right. Um, what I came to the conclusion—that's interesting. You ask that way because what I originally thought was, okay, someone from ancient China must have come to me to tell me these secrets. What I've come to since then is I, I did some past life meditations hmm. and I learned that I was actually an ancient Chinese. Okay. So what I now believe is that person from China that came to talk to me and tell me these secrets was me. It's in your frequency. This Thanks is the, the thing it now. Was... Okay. So this brings up another question that I, I've been begging to ask somebody I think would actually grok it, right? If this is so, that we have this let's say union of soul spirit i'm sorry soul body genetic code and mind instructional package <laughs> that these three then offer us the capacity for finding a perfected form fit and function in this body in the world <laughs> okay now you're opening the door for me to say one of what seems to be a very unpopular thought let's um, hear it i i do not and have not ever believed that we are supposed to die mm. okay i i think there's a lot of evidence out there i if you go back to the pre-king james bible into the gutenberg bible there was a book in that book that was removed to make our modern Bible that I've talked about, God didn't create death. Man created death for profit. And mm, that, that would that was, be profit over people and planet. So how do we flip the agenda to people and planet over profit? Well, because individually we have to get in into our minds that we really were never intended to die. That book also talked about there was only one man that was born to die, and that was Jesus. The rest of us were never intended to die. And when you talk about the Holy Trinity, what is it? Mind, body, and soul. Body is part of it. Mm -hmm. If you're going to let go of the body, you're never going to have a Holy Trinity. Right. So then you're going to repeat the cycle until you figure out how to hold on to it. This no. is what I think explains reincarnation. Oh, yeah. It's, it, you know, we gain, it would seem logical that we can only learn as much as we choose to in any given <laughs> life and then we have that okay the the refresher or the remedial right well, in, in between and then we come back and we go okay let's begin again 
right? But then part of what we need to learn is we got to stop telling ourselves that we have to die. Because mm -hmm. there's a concept that everybody's heard of called mind over matter. And nobody really thinks about it in terms of, I keep telling myself I got to die. So guess what? Right. And what about these people who, right, you and I both have experienced this. Death, the physical loss of form, does not eliminate the ability to communicate. Does not. Definitely does not. But I, I think there's a level that we need to get to where we think we can hold on to our bodies. I agree. We just agree. need to I've learn. I've had that notion to... in my being since I was a kid. Couldn't explain why. Don't know why. I don't care. I just do. That's the same with me. I've always known when somebody first told me you have to die, I thought you're wrong. You just need to get that out of your head. I've always known there's, you know, there's a specific discipline like any art or, di or practice or any form of practice that we do there's a discipline that's that takes place and that kind of discipline is it goes really deep right you have to it does you have and to eliminate all of those things that get in the way so that's a lot of self-examination as to how and what you think it really is and it really gets into how and what you think because what you think is going to manifest right so if you keep thinking we all have to die you're going to die I mean, I'm like, I'm telling people over and over, I'm here to prove to you that you don't need to. Now, you just got to hang around so you can see if I'm right. Right. Well, there's some guys, actually, there's a guy from here in Tempe, Bayard Spalding. You're probably even familiar with him. He wrote a series of books called The Life and Teachings of the Masters of the Far East. Why did he write that? He took a scientific team to Southeast Asia to explore those he'd heard about that lived for 800 years. And there were, they were documented. So he did all this scientific exploration, still really couldn't come up with explanations as to why, other than what we're talking about. Right. There's, there's, right. there's a lot of complication with that. Now, I'm, I'm going to take a slightly different track because I knew somebody that went over to China, went wandering around in the mountains in the rural area, and he met a female abbot. Hmm. And she literally told him that she could go back to her village, get her birth certificate, and prove she was 200 years old. Mm -hmm. But she looked like 20. Jet black hair. Perfect energy. It would seem that when you have no distractions to that pure energy that we are, which is simply the thoughts we accept to be true, then all that dissipates and that pure energy can come forth and, and this natural order which is eternal has the chance to appear in full manifestation now that's been really freaky to people of various worlds throughout history not just this one according to what i've read however it is part of that natural evolutionary process and from what I understand, there are advanced races who have also figured this out and are millions of years ahead of us, and some of them are thousands of years old. Absolutely. Now, there's a, a textbook that is actually the main textbook that Chinese medicine draws from. Hmm. It's called the Huang Di Neijing, and it's actually a collection. It was written 3,000 years ago. It's a collection of questions and answers and conversations between a guy named Huang Di and a guy named Chibo. Chibo was so knowledgeable about medicine back then that he was elevated to the status of a god, and they talk about him like he was a god. But mm. he was actually a real person. You can go back and check that out. And one of the questions that Huang Di asked Chibo one day was, why is it, and this remember, this is 3,000 years ago, Huang Di asked Chibo, why is it that if you look at people 50, 60, 70 years ago, they could get to 50 years old, 60 years old, 70 years old, do not look like they aged at all. And now when we get to 50, we look like old men. What happened? And Shibo told him, well, back then, people lived in tune with the universe. They ate what they were supposed to at a given time of year. They did the right exercises at the right time of year. They slept 
when they were supposed to the right time of the year. They lived in tune with the universe, mm -hmm. so, so they didn't really age. Now we're not living in tune with the universe. And again, 3,000 years ago, how far away from living in tune with the universe have we as a people gotten since then? Pretty far. And yet now we're coming up in this new area of space where the subtle energy has shifted. Frequency has changed. It's affecting the thoughtmosphere. It's affecting us because we're subtle energy beings. We're 70% water. Well, water is very easily influenced by energy. Yes. They're so like water. <laughs> yeah, I love that one. So these kinds of things seem to be drawing us upward to explore our nature, not just our nurture, but to go deeper into the nature of our being and explore what's there. You know, if there was an intelligent or several intelligent, okay, so that leads me to another weird experience, summer of 89, I've been questioning where, you know, where the Trinity come from, because it's ubiquitous in all the major religions. Yes, it is. And uh, my guide who I met in college shows up, his name's Zephyr. He was from the, what's now Southwestern U.S. over 20,000 years ago, according to what he shared with another through automatic writing. Um, and we had to go through a separate interpreter because all he could write was Sanskrit and the interpreter had to write it in English, right? And these were two guides that we asked to help. Bizarre stuff that, you know, and we were 19 in college at the time. So this was 89. Several years later, Zephyr shows up as I'm getting ready to go through a guided meditation and uh, with a facilitator. And so I've got my eyes closed, waiting for the next step. I see Zephyr show up in my vision. He waves to me, says, come, I'm out of body. We're traveling through the universe. Stars and stuff go by a little bit and then nothing. And I'm trying to, you know, understand where we're going. I'm asking a bunch of questions. And he just says, no, you'll figure that, you'll, you'll see, we'll get there. So we hadn't seen each other for several years. So we just had a conversation about the recap of where I'd been over the years. Suddenly we arrive at this three sun system with about a dozen other lush green planets that were maybe a hundredth the size of the three spheres. And I felt like Jodie Foster coming out of the wormhole. Tears streaming down my face. I was just in awe. And then I hear several voices as one saying, we are not only your forefathers, we're also the forefathers of your solar system. I wanted to ask more questions. I was like, ah, uh, what? And, you know, and so I wanted to stick around and ask questions. Zephyr says, nope, that's it. You got all you need. You'll figure it out. And so back we came. Two interesting things out of that. I got on the way back, macro, micro is proton, electron, and neutron. It's the space in between that holds the consciousness that navigates it all. The other thing was that it took eight minutes to get there and eight minutes to get back. So the time was consistent. Hmm. And that was a reference that the facilitator gave. Now, I mentioned the Urantia book earlier. That's the only place I could find a reference to the speed of thought. And they state it at 841 trillion miles per second. Long way. Yeah. So I don't know if any of that's true. It was just my experience. And I had some references to give it a um, probability factor, I suppose. Still willing to question, still diving deep, you know, not attached to it all. I just want to know the truth. Right. I mean, and that's part of the thing, I think. We both had some really out-of-body, higher spiritual experiences. If you're not willing to continue questioning them, you're not going to learn more and more and more about them. Sure. I mean, now, what do you think I... about folks that get caught up in them and make it their life mission to share the same thing over and over and make money off of it. Well, nah. yeah, I think you know what I think about that. I, I have always... Okay, let's leave it there and just, you know, that way we don't have any other kerfuffles in the conversation. <laughs> right, I mean, I... Oh, man, it's hard for me not to touch on that one, though. Okay, I got to say something. Okay. All right, I have been... Okay, even an astrologer one time told me, you have all of the makings of a medium but you don't have any of the trappings. So nobody knows I can do this. Nobody knows I can contact other people in other worlds. 
I don't do this actively. I am open to other people contacting me. Isn't that the way it's supposed to be? Right, uh, in my right. opinion. But I, I think it, I, I've only done it while well, I did it. I've, in most cases, these contacts have been to pass on messages to people that someone somewhere else thought someone should have. I never charge for it because I think that really kind of sullies the whole thing. Yeah. Well, this those is, messages often, if correct me if I'm wrong, in, in, are a way to allow those still here to let go. Absolutely. Every one of them has had some element of that. Let go of this, let go of that, let go of this. And everyone that comes and talks to me gives me a little message for that person that I wouldn't know if I hadn't spoken to that other person. So I can go tell them, your aunt says this, and they know I've never met their aunt, but it's something mm -hmm. that connects Herbage with it. Is like, uh, only my aunt could say that, right? Exactly, and they, so they know that this is a real message and, and that I'm passing on something that their aunt really thinks is important for them to learn. And it's always about let go. And a lot of times it's let go of your fears, let go mm -hmm. of your ego, let go of all of this stuff that's holding you back from being who you could be. Right. And you find that in, in the letting go, I, I know for me, I'm going to ask for you, do you find that it's really just a state of constant awe? Absolutely. I mean, it, it is. And I also will add to that, that people think it's hard to let go. It's really not. Mm -mm. I mean, once you take that leap and let go, you find out, wow, that was way easier. I feel so much better. I feel consciously lighter mm -hmm. and I feel like already I'm moving forward. It's a simple choice. However, it has to be followed up with a commitment to the choice. Absolutely. And oftentimes, you know, the big C word, and we call it the C word, and we're scared to death, whether we're, you know, whether it's in a relationship with ourselves or another, right? We have this fear of rejection, of dejection, of uh, abandonment. Right. We operate a lot on fear. And, you know, you're never going to grow unless you face your fears. No. I had a good friend, uh, Willie Whitefeather, he, uh, mixed blood Cherokee storyteller. He says, you know, fear is just false evidence appearing real. This was 1990. He, he, I hadn't heard it before. Since then, I've heard it multiple times from other places. Mm -hmm. Right. As I'm sure you have as well. He Absolutely. says, so it, it's, you want to, it's false evidence appearing real. What we seek to do is free every anxious reaction. And I kind of, you know, being the flippant, child i still am i said yeah but most people just want to f everything and run right uh, that's pretty much true and we do we will avoid simple stuff over and over again until it gets so horrific in our own behavior and experience that somebody else has to say hey look you know you want your life to change then you need to change your behavior Absolutely. See, this is not to bring it back to my current day or anything. This is basically what I'm telling business leaders and managers that if you want the workplace to change, you need to be the one to make the change. Mm -hmm. And you need to be the one to let go of your ego, which nobody wants to hear. And um, that's okay. I don't mind telling them through things but I don't would like to hear. hear. There's no ego without we go. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> You know, that's the transcendence, right? Ego is not a bad thing. No, it's, you have to have where a you put ego. it and, and how you prioritize it. And if it fits in with others, then great. Exactly. I mean, I think a healthy ego is important. Absolutely. But letting your ego rule your world is kind of a trap. And you need to know how, where that fine line is between having a healthy ego and having the ego that's actually running your life. Mm-hmm. And, um, usually through fear because you're scared of loss of something absolutely so you're compensating times, to avoid it and a lot of times once what we've already said is once you finally face that fear and let go of that you find out you're so much happier you've actually in your, in your life lighter. works so much yes lighter and then getting back into the Taoism thing you end up living in tune with the universe again 
mm -hmm. and everything goes smoothly and you have there's no more friction what what kai speaking to always one of the things that kai d said to me uh was that you know in our way the Taoist way something is either desirable or undesirable and that's pretty much it and you know you know you know internally what's desirable and what's not because you don't think it you sense it right now this leads to we can't think our way through a system built on vibration we've got to sense our way through it how do we do that now this gets back to what we were saying earlier now when i was six and i had to learn those things mm -hmm. i didn't think through it i kept my mind empty i kept my mind relaxed and open and did the deep breathing and i sensed what i was supposed to do so this is all about and again you let go right I let go so and this is there was something everything we've been saying yeah let go just remain calm breathe empty open and you'll get the impression oh but somebody else might take over my body i'm scared to death oh yeah some okay evil entity will I, was enter a, me and... I think we were all afraid of that for a while i was afraid of that and here's the thing that i got from one of those connections right would you consciously allow someone to do that no you're not going to allow somebody to do that on any level nobody can take over your body unless you let them do that Mm -hmm. on some level and if you know that when you're awake and you're conscious and you're like i'm i'm normal right now i would never let anybody do that just know that at your deepest level you would never let anybody do that and no one can just take over your body unless you let them on some level i had a dream once i had i used to have repetitive dreams that's that's how i learned my messages for a long time when i was a kid and i had this dream the longest time over and over and over until i finally figured out the message here i would go to sleep and have this dream where i was dropped off by everything was black and white except me all right i could i can notice the color in my mm -hmm. in my, my dreams are not normally in black and white so that was very significant i was dropped off at a train station and i'd go up to the you know, up to the guy at the office and i'd ask him when is the next train coming in and he would say there's no train stopping here so then I would look around and there was this crowd of people with big staffs with upside down inverted double crosses and they were chasing me around and they would always chase me to the same place and they would chase me to the bottom of a hill where I would be standing outside of a house where I just knew in my head that there was a witch living in this house that wanted me to come into the house. And it was kind of creepy for a little while. And then mm -hmm. one night when I was in that dream, I was standing outside that house. First of all, I got to the point where if I got dropped off at that train station, I just ran to the bottom of the hill and stood in front of the house because <laughs> nobody ever chased me. You then. circumvent everything because you know it's going to be there anyway, right? Exactly. That's yeah. why I know I'm going and I've got to figure out, like, why am I here? Okay, so finally, when I did that a few times, went straight down there, straight down there, I was standing in front of her house one night and I realized I, she can't come and get me. I have to go in. And this was the last time I ever had that dream. And when I woke up, I totally understood. You have, they have to have your permission to take over. Mm -hmm. And I'm not gonna give them my permission, not in any state, not at any level, not even in the dream world, would I ever give them that permission. And after that moment, I never had any concerns about if I do an out of body experience, somebody's gonna take over my body. If I, if I relax and let go, something evil is going to take over. No, it's not going to happen. You have to understand that you would not let that happen. It's not going to happen. You have to let them do that. Now, that doesn't mean that others may not attempt to do so. Oh, I, sure. And I'll use this example. Um, it was during that same time frame, 89-ish. You know, I was still, re I'd just gone through a messy divorce, left the corporate world and the church and everything, and was just finding myself again. And I became um, the director for a group called the New Age Alliance, which was a collective of member groups, churches, study groups, uh, centers, all that. It was about 25, 26 total. And I was with a, a friend 
now and i say that because there's a point to it i was with a friend at another friend's house all three of us were year book students we were standing in his kitchen and we were talking and his the guy's apartment he had two uh, dane dalmatian mixes beautiful huge dogs and isis and osiris so isis was laying on the kitchen floor and as we're talking, and I all of a sudden I get this sick feeling in the pit, pit of my stomach. Couldn't figure out what it is. And we continue talking, and, and then all of a sudden my vision starts to go. And I'm like, guys, I don't know what's going on here. I, I get this sick feeling in the pit of my stomach. I, I can't see now with my eyes wide open. Keep an eye on me. And within a few seconds, I get a pull from my solar plexus so hard that it snaps my neck, my neck back my head <laughs> my sunglasses fall off into the stainless steel sink with a clank and i'm up on my tiptoes and the two guys grab my shoulders and it stops instantly oh why because i let go i totally trusted them right in that moment now later i got home and i called a friend of mine up that his um had a doctorate in metaphysics and especially was demonology witchcraft and sorcery and i said hey chuck what's going on with this and i explained the situation he says turns it back on me well what do you think <laughs> and i said well i think someone's because it was through isis eyes that's what i noticed first was they were saturn and all get out i'd never seen them that way and some there was an exchange and so in explaining to him there was a practice done by certain groups of projecting energy consciousness through animals in order to get to other people and if they were afraid or angry then they could pull them out so he said what you did was perfect if you hadn't if you probably wouldn't be talking to me right now well what was that i let go i had no fear there was nothing right. for them to hold on to so in that sense the perfect protection is no protection whatsoever well it's absolutely faith, love and trust that's all it takes but if you're afraid they got you yeah and the, the, that's why we've got to let go of our fear and that gets back to what you're saying what are you afraid if they if they're going to take over mm -hmm. no fear right you have to be confident in the fact that you don't have to be scared of that because they will try there's no doubt when i was a little kid i used to tell my mom i hated going in public because i could tell my mom that I literally could see people's demons. I could see the demons that were being carried around by people, and it just kind of freaked me out. Yeah, we call them demons. They're just demons. that's just the word they, I use. They just want to aggravate things. Yeah, they got yeah. unfinished business. And I'm not. I'm not out. sure I would use that term today, yeah. but that's the term I used back then. Oh, it, and it still is used for a lot of things absolutely and they they totally torment but that's what i'm saying there aren't things hanging around us that would like to try but as long as you have no fear and you have confidence right. you have faith and you have love in your heart they can't well it, and again we attract them because of our frequency it, it's a it's a different kind of empathic resonance because it's not really empathic resonance it's just resonance with the frequency that we're at that opens the door for that attracts those kind of back to you know what we think we're going to produce well we're in that place we're going to bring others to that place absolutely. that around us whether they're yeah. in body or not absolutely in absolutely and honestly once i had all these realizations after that one dream and i had a couple other realizations the things that were tormenting me and trying to bother me stopped mm -hmm because my energy shifted i got more calm i got more trusting i got more believing in you know that's a biggie trust yeah absolutely you have to trust that that's that you're protected you have to trust that you have the power to protect yourself mm -hmm. and, and you're protected and once i gained that trust and that understanding these things stopped bothering me mm. and it's so cool you know because there are you know, there's myriad things there's myriad worlds and, and many things happen we have all kinds of opportunities to experience a variety of things we choose whether we realize or not what those experiences are going to be now whether that's a conscious choice or a, high, a choice of the higher self for us to learn our next level right 
right? I mean, there are lessons to be learned. And uh, we all would just have to be of open to learning those lessons. Yeah, and the more open you are, the faster they'll get done. Absolutely. I totally agree with that. So, gosh, this is just, Keith, I, I really enjoyed this conversation. I, you can see how animated I got. This is just exciting because <laughs> it's very rare that I get a chance to uh, discuss things at the level that we've been able to. Not that I'm setting myself up or, or anything like that. It's just, you know, we're rare birds and it's okay. Yeah, um, it's absolutely okay. So with others, because it acknowledging you know i'm another you you're another me and there are others like us what would you offer kind of as a, a closing tasty tidbit for others who are beginning their search or confronting some of their own stuff and, and maybe some um you know some ways of, of addressing or moving through or letting go Okay, now I'm always going to take it back to the Qigong practices that I do because that's what I know the best. That's what you do. Right. And in the world that I, what I teach is very simple Qigong practices because a lot of what is going on in the world right now for Qigong is kind of complicated. It's fancy. It looks really cool. Mm -hmm. but it takes a lot of thought. And if you have to put a lot of thought into it, you're going to cut off energy or chi flow. If you've got some practices that allow mindfulness and meditation in a very simple manner to where you don't have to use any conscious thought, you're able to put yourself in that proper state and relax and empty your mind. And, and that's what I would ask people to do is just find a place in your life where you can be quiet, where you don't have a lot of distractions. I'm going to say this. I say this all the time. This is not on right now. There's my phone. I've got my black. I can't see it because of the background. But uh, learn to turn off your phone. I, I take at home even. Yeah, at, absolutely. At home, people I think today are afraid to turn off their phones. Like the whole world's going to stop if they turn off their phones. Learn to turn off your phone. Find a quiet place. Get into a nice state where there's comfortable. I personally am not a fan of seated meditations. We're kind of out of time, so I don't want to get into that. But I, I don't think that's the healthy. I like the walking, uh, more of the, the bhakti yoga style. Right. Okay. Standing and moving meditations. Seated, I'm going to have, I have to touch this now before we go, because since I said it. Seated meditations, even from a medical world where I just came out of eight years in school, um, sitting is being called the new smoking. It's that unhealthy to sit for a prolonged period of time. Oh. Um, when you talk about the common issues people have with seated meditations, they talk about numbness, tingling, and cramping in their lower bodies. When you look over at the medical journals and look at chronic lack of circulation in the lower body, they call numbness, numbness tingling, tingling, cramping. The same exact <laughs> list of symptoms. And right. that also sets you up for potential health risks that are really serious. It increases your chances of stroke. It increases your chances of heart disease. It increases your chance of deep vein thrombosis. It actually causes shrunken organs in your lower abdomen. Hmm. There is nothing good about prolonged sitting. So I really don't understand why people are promoting seated meditations. In a few years ago, they didn't know all these things. Now we do. So this needs to make a shift. So I'm glad that you're doing walking meditations. It really makes me feel good. Um, and, and anyone that's doing these seated meditations, don't take my word for it. My sitting meditations are on my drums. <laughs> yeah. And, and I'm saying, don't take my word for it. Look it up. Yeah. They're, they're not healthy. And the well, medical... All of the things we've talked about, there's references to them all over the place. You oh, absolutely. Be, but you have to be willing to go look. Exactly. You have to be willing to accept that. Nothing we said is not referenceable. Mm -hmm. Even the most outlandish stuff that we talked about, and we didn't even get as outlandish as we could, but I mean, we're running out of time. Mm -hmm. um, it's all referenceable. If, you, if you're willing to open your mind to what we've been talking about, there's so many references out there that will validate what we've been saying. But what I'm saying, most importantly, stop doing the seated meditations. Learn a standing meditation or a walking meditation or a moving meditation and put your mind in that empty state where you are receptive and able to receive 
the messages you need to receive. Cool. Keith, this has been phenomenal. I'm sure our audience is just going to be wowed and in awe by some of the things we've talked about. And I thank you so much. Um, such a pleasure, honor. Um, I mean, I feel all those things. I'm so glad you invited me on the show. Uh, I, I think we could talk for hours. And probably will soon. And I hope we do soon. I hope this is not our last conversation. It won't be. And thank you once again. You're welcome. And thank you all. Namaste and in la catch. Thanks so much for sticking with us for this excellent conversation and episode of One World in the New World. I'm Zen Benefield, your host, and I'll see you next time.